In our next lesson on protein structure in Chapter 4, we want to look specifically at tertiary structure. We find it's often the most stable conformation under a given set of condition. It involves some weak forces such as hydrogen bonds, some hydrophilic and hydrophobic forces, but there are also stronger bonds involved such as ionic bonds and disulfide bonds. Remember most proteins are globular in their overall structure. Here we have triose phosphate isomerase. We have the space filling model on the top of our figure and that gives us a pretty good idea of the size but it's hard to distinguish the secondary structure. For that we need the ribbon diagram on the bottom. You can see the alpha helices on the outer portion of the protein and the beta strands on the inside. For all of the structures that we will look at, whether it's the space filling model or these ribbon diagrams, these all came from uh, crystal structures and we're going to refer to that a little bit later in this chapter. So proteins can have different combinations of these patterned structures. In part A here we have a protein that's all alpha helices. B is all beta sheets. C is a combination of alpha and beta. And D has very little secondary structure. So you can see there's very many possibilities here. Now in each of these cases there is some irregular part to the structure. So we have loops connecting the alpha helices here. These are the green ribbons here. Also loops connecting the beta strands. Now these are not disordered. They're simply irregular. That is to say they don't fit into a pattern like an alpha helices or a beta sheet, but it's part of the regular ordered structure of the protein and we know that because it always folds up in the same way. They fold up in very specific, very consistent ways and that means that the fold is spontaneous. With regard to hydrophobic versus hydrophilic amino acid residues, it's driven mostly by the hydrophobic effect. That is to say, as the protein folds, those hydrophobic residues tend to be less solvent exposed and the hydrophilic or more solvent exposed. So in our figure here at the bottom we have the hydrophobic residues in green and you can see even though they are somewhat on the surface of the protein, they tend to be buried within crevices, whereas the hydrophilic residues are very much solvent exposed. So we find that this is driven not so much by hydrogen bonding as by that hydrophobic effect. So it has a great impact on almost all biological molecules, including proteins. We find proteins can fold up into distinct domains even within the same polypeptide chain and this is often because different domains within the same protein have different functions. So here in A we have a single polypeptide chain folding into two separate distinct domains colored in red and green and you can see different sizes, different shapes, relating very much to their function. Remember structure always relates to function. In B we have a single chain, two domains, but more symmetrical in structure. And then finally on the far right we have illustrated the DNA binding, uh, DNA binding domain of a protein. And You can see it's perfectly situated to interact with that DNA molecule. We're going to return to consider this type of domain uh, in a later chapter. In terms of stabilizing the protein conformation, we can form ion pairs between basic and acidic residues, but they don't contribute significantly to stability. We gain a certain strength in that electrostatic interaction, but we lose a certain amount of entropy in order to form the ion pair. There are also disulfide bonds that can form between cysteine residues. Remember, this is a very strong covalent bond. It can form either within or between peptide chains. It's pretty rare in intracellular proteins because that's a reducing environment. Remember, these are oxidized bonds. So if the environment is reducing, those cysteine residues will be reduced to sulfhydryl residues and can't be oxidized to form the disulfide bonds. If we do form those disulfide bonds, that can help to maintain that protein conformation. Finally, there can be cofactors to help the protein maintain its conformation. Illustrated here we have a zinc finger and that's stabilized by a zinc ion illustrated here. That zinc ion has no chemical function whatsoever. Its sole purpose is to maintain that three-dimensional conformation. 
So we find when the protein folds, here we have our protein on the far right. Remember the primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. And then it starts to form those patterned secondary structures, alpha helices and beta sheets. And that begins to compact, to start to fold that tertiary fold, that tertiary conformation, folds a little, compacts a little bit more, and then here's our final conformation. When we denature the protein, and we can do that with pH, temperature, ion concentration, we're going to reverse in the same order. That is to say, we'll lose tertiary structure first, then secondary structure. We don't lose the primary structure though. Only very harsh conditions or an enzymatic reaction can break those peptide bonds. Remember, the folding of the protein illustrated on the far right here is not a random process. The instructions for folding are simply in the sequence of the amino acids themselves. That is to say, which amino acids are present in which position. We're going to illustrate this in a demonstration in class. So in our next lesson we want to look at what happens when proteins don't fold properly and then how can these poly separate polypeptide chains associate to form a functioning unit.